to therapies to the clinic. A major focus of the Hassan Laboratory is le developing mesothelium targeted agents for treating cancer. These include an anti mesothelium immunotoxin, a chimeric monoclonal antibody to mesothelium, uh, and uh, anti mesothelium antibody drug conjugate, and a mesothelium vaccine. He has published over 200 papers uh, with citation more than 5,000. Professor Hassan will talk about advances in the immunotherapy for mesothelioma today. Uh, the microphone is yours, uh, Dr. Hassan. Uh, could you please start? Sure. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. And it is indeed a pleasure to present at this meeting. Uh, I know many of you personally, uh, meeting you at the meetings as well as in my visits to Turkey. So it's really an honor to be speaking at this lecture. And as you mentioned, I will try to talk about recent advances in immunotherapy of malignant mesothelioma and talk uh, towards the end about some of the work that we are doing. Uh, so these are my disclosures. So I'll be talking a uh, brief background about mesothelioma, uh, talk about immunotherapy using immune checkpoint inhibitors, and lastly, talk about our work using mesothelin targeted immunotherapy. Uh, as you know, uh, mesothelioma is a tumor that arises from uh, sites that are lined by mesothelial cells. So uh, it arises from the mesothelial lining of the pleura, so that's the pleural mesothelioma, as well as uh, from the peritoneum, and very occasionally from the uh, lining of the heart or the tunica vaginalis. But the most common form of mesothelioma is pleural mesothelioma, as well as peritoneum mesothelioma. Uh, mesothelioma, as you are well aware, uh, asbestos is the primary cause of mesothelioma, and uh, patients with Hodgkin's disease and non-Hodgkin lymphoma that has received radiation are also at increased risk of developing mesothelioma. And more recently, germline mutations in BAF1 predisposed patients to mesothelioma. So uh, there is, uh, and more recently work in which uh, uh, Dr. Mitentes and others collaborated, there could be germline mutations in BLM gene that could also predispose to it. So asbestos, although we typically think of it as an asbestos-induced uh, malignancy or adrenite-induced malignancy, it can also happen in patients who have got prior radiation or who have germline mutations in DNA repair genes. As I mentioned, uh, malignant pleural mesothelioma is an aggressive disease with poor prognosis. Uh, most of the patients present with advanced disease and are not candidates for surgical resection. And for a long time, the only FDA-approved therapy for this disease was chemotherapy with pemetrexate plus cisplatin that was approved in 2004. And this is the landmark study by Vogelzang and colleagues, uh, a phase three study of pemetrexate plus cisplatin versus cisplatin alone in patients with advanced mesothelioma. As you can see, the median overall survival of patients who got pemetrexate and cisplatin was 12.1 months, uh, whereas with cisplatin alone, it was 9.3 months. And for a long time, uh, this was the only uh, standard therapy for this disease. So uh, has there been progress since 2004? Although it's a rare disease, mesothelioma has been an area of active clinical investigation. And there are multiple uh, phase two, phase three trials that have been done in this disease. But most of these studies have been negative. However, there are some promising therapies uh, that have uh, emerged over the last uh, two, three years. And this is an example of um, the different strategies currently in clinical trials for therapy of malignant mesothelioma. Uh, starting clockwise, we have the arginine deprivation therapy using pegylated DMNAs. And this type of therapy is in phase three trial for sarcomatoid mesothelioma. A lot of work going on with intrapleural adenovirus therapies uh, led by Steve Albalda at University of Pennsylvania. And as well as uh, uh, 
vaccines such as dendritic cell-based vaccine and anti-angiogenic therapies, including bevacizumab. And a phase three study showed that pemetrexate cisplatin bevacizumab was better than pemetrexate cisplatin alone. But what I'm going to talk about today is immune checkpoint blockade using anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1, anti-PDL1 antibodies for treatment of mesothelioma and some of the recent data, as well as our work to develop mesothelin targeted therapy for cancer. So starting with immune checkpoint blockade in mesothelioma, uh, this is a schema from a review published a few years ago uh, talking about the different immune checkpoint. Uh, shown on the left is a lymph node. When the T cells uh, see the tumor as a peptide uh, presented by dendritic cells, that leads to T cell activation. But the T cells overexpress uh, a checkpoint called CTLA-4, cytotoxic T lymphocyte antigen 4, which dampens the T cell response. And in the tumor shown here is the cancer cell. You have the tumor cells, and this is the T cells. And the T cells recognize the tumor uh, antigen presented to the T cell receptor. But to prevent too much activation of the T cells, the T cells express the receptors called PD-1, uh, uh, as well as the tumor cells over express a receptor called PDL one So these two receptors put breaks on the immune activation. So you have the CTLA-4 inhibitory uh, molecule that limits T cell activation, and you have the PD-1 of the T cells and PDL-1 of the tumor cells, which inhibits the immune activation. So there has been obviously a lot of interest over the last five, six years to develop inhibitors to CTLA-4, for example, ipilimumab, that leads to T cell activation, or to develop antibodies to PD-1 or PD-L1 that again leads to T cell activation. So this is a very limited uh, uh, list of examples of immune checkpoints in mesothelioma. So you have the anti-CTLA-4 antibodies such as tremolimumab and ipilimumab, anti-PDL1 antibodies such as evolumab and duralumab, as well as anti-PD1 antibodies, for example, pembrolizumab and nivolumab. So one of the first clinical trials of immune checkpoint in mesothelioma was the anti-CTLA4 antibody tremolimumab as second or third line treatment for unresectable malignant mesothelioma. So this was a placebo-controlled trial, the determined study. And uh, so in this study, patients either received tremolimumab or they received uh, a placebo <coughs> shown here in the green. As you can see, there's no difference in overall uh, survival with tremolimumab or placebo. So this was a negative study showing that tremolimumab by itself had no benefit in patients with advanced mesothelioma. Uh, so evolumab is an anti-PDL1 antibody, uh, and we evaluated it in a phase 1b trial called the Javelin trial. And shown here is the anti-tumor efficacy of evolumab. So out of the 53 patients, uh, nine patients had an objective partial response, and the response was seen irrespective of the tumor PDL1 expression. So there was some hint of activity with about 10% of the patients having a partial response. And this was an important study by Evan Alley published in 2017 of an anti-PD-1 antibody pembrolizumab. This was the Keynote 028 study. In this study, patients uh, were screened for tumor PD-L1 expression. 25 patients were treated on the single arm study and the response rate was about 20%. And some of the responses appeared durable. So this, these studies showed proof of principle that anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 antibodies had activity in patients with advanced mesothelioma. So a non-chemotherapy regimen did lead to objective tumor response. So there are a lot of clinical trials that are ongoing. 
uh, and which have been published using either the PD-1, PDL-1, or CTLA-4 antibodies. But the ma major advance in mesothelioma has been the Checkmate 743 trial that was published earlier this year in Lancet, which was a first-line nivolumab, which is an anti-PD-1 antibody, plus ipilimumab, which is an anti-CTLA-4 antibody in risk unresectable malignant pleural mesothelioma. So this was a multicenter randomized phase three trial. So this is the trial design of the Checkmate 743 study. The key eligibility criteria were unresectable pleural mesothelioma, no prior systemic therapy, good performance status, and the patients were uh, stratified by epithelioid or non-epithelioid histology and gender. So it was a large study with 605 patients enrolled, and the patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either get immunotherapy with nivolumab, three milligrams per kilogram every two weeks, or epilumumab, one milligram per kilogram every six weeks for up to two years. And the second group of patients got cisplatin or carboplatin plus pemetrexate for six cycles. Patients continued on the study until disease progression. The primary endpoint of the study was overall survival, and the secondary endpoints included response rate, disease control rate, and PFS. So these are the patient characteristics. Uh, so the median age was well balanced between the immunotherapy versus chemotherapy arm, predominantly male patients, good performance status, uh, and uh, there were 57% current or former smokers. And 76% of the patients on both arms had epithelioid histology and 24 were non-epithelioid. And uh, the PDL1 stratification was balanced. So it was a well-designed study that different treatment groups were well balanced between the immunotherapy and the chemotherapy arm. So this is the response rate. So the overall response rate in the immunotherapy arm was 40% uh, with 2% complete response, whereas the overall response rate in the chemotherapy arm was 43%. So very similar response rate. And the duration, however, the duration of response was significantly better in the immunotherapy arm shown here in the brown. At 12 months, 47% of the patients had an ongoing response compared to 26% in the chemotherapy arm. So the median duration of response in the immunotherapy arm was 11 months compared to 6.7 months in the chemotherapy arm. So clearly, although the response rate was same, the duration of response was much better in the immunotherapy arm. And this is the overall survival for all the patients. So the median overall survival for all the patient was 18.1 months in the immunotherapy arm compared to 14 months in the chemotherapy arm. And this difference was statistically significant with a p-value of 0 0.0020. So clearly the chemo immunotherapy arm resulted in increased overall survival. But what is significant is when they looked at overall survival by histology. So this is uh, the group of patients with epithelioid histology. In the immunotherapy arm, the median overall survival was 18 months versus 16.5 months in the chemotherapy arm with a hazard ratio of 0.86. But what is really very impressive is the overall survival in patients with sarcomatoid mesothelioma. We all know that sarcomatoid mesothelioma is an aggressive cancer, and really chemotherapy has very little benefit. So this was pretty dramatic difference. The median overall survival in the non-epithelioid or the sarcomatoid histology was 18 months compared to eight months in the chemotherapy arm. So more than double the median overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.46. In terms of adverse event, uh, the adverse events in the immunotherapy arm were as expected uh, with most common side effects of pruritus, rash, hypothyroidism, increased lipase. And uh, most of these side effects were grade one and grade two. We also had some grade three side effects such as uh, diarrhea, increased lipase. 
And with the chemotherapy arm, the side effects were as expected with bone marrow suppression being most calm. So in summary, uh, the Checkmate 743 trial is a landmark study in mesothelioma, and it really is defining the standard of care for these patients. So this trial showed that frontline therapy with epilumab plus nivolumab increased overall survival compared to chemotherapy. And this benefit was mostly driven by an increase in overall survival in sarcomatoid mesothelioma. The effect on overall survival is less profound in epithelioid mesothelioma. And I think uh, at, in some centers uh, with epithelioid mesothelioma, uh, physicians still prefer the chemotherapy arm, although uh, using a non-chemotherapy arm is clearly a very good option also. And based on this work, uh, the FDA approved uh, nivolumab plus epilumab for patients with mesothelioma, and it represents the first approval in this disease over the last 16 years. So clearly, uh, immunotherapy has uh, made a significant impact in this disease, and it is now a standard of care for newly diagnosed patients. And there are other trials going on combining immunotherapy with chemotherapy or other agents. So uh, now I'm going to switch gears and talk about uh, our work, uh, which has focused on mesothelin targeted therapies for mesothelioma. So uh, many years ago, uh, we described uh, mesothelin as a new target for immunotherapy. Uh, for treatment of solid tumors. And uh, then about uh, 10 years ago, we uh, also reviewed all the progress that had been made in developing mesothelin targeted therapies. So mesothelin is a cell surface glycoprotein. Uh, it is made as a precursor protein of 71 kilo Dalton, which is attached to the cell membrane by a GPI anchor and it is processed by the protease furin into a shed fragment called MPF or megakaryocyte potentiating factor and a membrane bound fragment that we call mesothelin. So the therapies that we are developing are targeting this molecule which is attached to the cell membrane. The most important thing is that the expression of mesothelin in normal human tissues is limited only to the mesothelial cells lining the pleura, peritoneum, and pericardium. And that's what makes it a good target for immunotherapy because there is no expression on important organs such as heart, lung, brain, kidneys. The normal biologic function of mesothelin is not known, but we and others have shown that mesothelin binds MUC16 and may play a role in tumor metastasis. Mesothelin is highly expressed in many solid tumors. Almost 100% of mesotheliomas, epithelial type, express mesothelin, as do pancreatic cancer, about 70% of ovarian cancers, 50% of lung adenocarcinoma, as well as a variety of other cancers. So that the therapies that we are developing to target mesothelin, if successful, have broad applicability to treating cancer. Uh, there are a number of mesothelin targeted therapies that are currently in clinical trials. Uh, these include immunotoxins, for example, LMB100, antibody drug conjugates, such as enitibab rabtensine, uh, radioimmunotherapy using thorium-224, bispecific antibodies, as well as adoptive cell therapy using chimeric antigen receptor T cells or trucks. So I'm going to talk today about uh, uh, our recent work using immunotoxin as well as adaptive cell therapy uh, for treatment of uh, mesothelioma. Uh, SS1P was the first anti-mesothelin drug to enter the clinic. Uh, it's an immunotoxin which consists of an anti-mesothelin FE that recognizes the tumor 
linked to a pseudomonas toxin made by the bacteria Pseudomonas aeruginosa called P38. So it's a bacterial toxin. When it attaches to the cells, it inhibits protein synthesis leading to cell death. And in our preclinical studies, we showed that it was cytotoxic to tumor cells of patients with mesothelioma. We showed that it was safe, but the dose limit in toxicity was pleuritis because it bound to the normal pleura, but it was immunogenic. So about 90% of the patients developed neutralizing antibodies to SS1P after just one cycle. So, so our group, uh, uh, our Pastent lab has developed LMB100. It's an immu improved immunotoxin which targets mesothelin. So as I mentioned, SS1 consists of the FV linked to the pseudomonas toxin. LMB100 consists of the FAB part of the antibody linked to a toxin uh, which is less immunogenic. So the goal is that we hope that LMB100 will be less immunogenic, so you can give multiple cycles of treatment. And in our preclinical studies, we showed that LMB100 is much more toxic to tumor cells from patients with mesothelioma uh, with an increase in activity of 5 to 25 fold. So based on these preclinical studies, we did a phase one clinical trial of LMB100 in patients with mesothelioma. Uh, 25 patients were enrolled on this study. So these were patients who had advanced mesothelioma who had failed chemotherapy. We established the maximum tolerated dose of LMB100 when it was given on days one and one, three, and five of a three week cycle. The dose limit in toxicity was vascular leak syndrome which consists of uh, edema, weight gain, hypertension. All patients had good blood levels in cycle one and half in cycle two. And out of the 10 patients with mesothelioma, nine had stable disease. So it was a little bit better than SS1P, but still most of the patients got antibodies after cycle two. So there was not, uh, patients could get only a certain number of doses of LMB100. But what was very interesting was that LMB100 leads to a systemic inflammatory response in patients. So this is looking at C-reactive protein, which is a uh, marker of inflammation. And shown here is the C-reactive proteins in these 10 patients before therapy and after they got LMB100. So in almost all the patients, there was an increase in L CRP. Similarly, we looked at plasma cytokines in patients following LMB100 treatment and looking at pre and post cytokines, uh, looking at interferon gamma, IL-8, IL-6, MCP1, and IL-18. And in most of the patients, as you can see, there is increase in cytokine, again, supporting uh, that LMB100 treatment leads to inflammation. And we also looked at uh, tumors of patients who had biopsies before and after LMB100 treatment and showing the increase in CD8 T cells, including exhausted CD8 cells after treatment. So we see inflammation both in the blood as well as in the tumor. So this has led to our current hypothesis that intratumor injection of LMB100 could stimulate cancer immunity. So we believe that injecting LMB100 directly into the tumor could lead to increase in tumor inflammation and CD8 positive T cell infiltration, and that CTLA4 blocking antibody could increase the efficacy of these T cells. And this is based on work done by my collaborator, Ara Pastin and uh, Yasmin Leshem in his lab, where they looked at combining LMB100 with CTLA4 blocking antibodies. To do so, they used uh, a mouse breast cancer cell line that expresses human mesothelin in a human mesothelin BABC mice, so which, uh, which are immunocompetent mice. And uh, to do that, they took these immunocompetent mice and injected two tumors on two flanks. And then they injected one tumor, but not the other tumor. 
So in the first group of mice, they injected these tumors with PBS or saline. And you can see both the injected tumors and the uninjected tumors continue to grow. Next, they treated, injected the tumors with SS1P, which had very little effect and the tumors continued to grow, as did the uninjected tumors. And next, they treated mice with the anti-CTLA4 antibody, which by itself had no activity in the injected or uninjected tumor. But when they injected mice with SS1P, plus they gave anti-CTLA4, 10 of the 12 mice had complete tumor regression, as did about half the mice in the uninjected tumor. So this was a very important observation showing that injecting LMB100 directly into the tumor plus anti-CTLA4 antibody leads to complete regression in most of the injected tumors, but also in half of the uninjected tumors, showing that these mice had developed uh, cancer immunity. And when you took out the tumors from these mice, so this is the PBS group of mice, this is the SS1P, alone treated mice, CTLA4, alone treated mice. But when you look at the combination, you can see increase in filtration of immune cells, T cells in these tumors. Similarly, they have shown that if you take LMB100, uh, if you inject it into tumors by itself, it has no effect. If you inject, if you give CTLA4 antibody, it has very little effect. But when you use the combination, about 70% of the mice develop complete response. So we believe that injection of LMB100 into the tumor plus systemic anti CTLA4 antibody can lead to tumor regression in mice. So based on this work, we have just initiated a pilot study of intratumoral injection of LMB100 followed by systemic ipilimumab in patients with mesothelioma. So in this study, patients will receive LMB100 given directly into the tumors on day one and four of cycle one and cycle two. They will get ipilimumab on day two of cycle one and cycle two, as well as cycle three and cycle four. And we'll be doing a lot of other correlative science. And uh, this trial was just approved by the IRB and we look forward to treating patients with advanced mesothelioma on the study to determine whether intratumor injection of the immunotoxin plus CTLA4 results in improved anti-tumor efficacy in patients. And lastly, I will talk about some of our recent work with TC210, also called GABOCELL. This is work that I presented at the IMIC meeting a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so, as many of you know that chimeric antigen receptor T cell or CAR T cell uh, have made significant impact for treatment of leukemias and lymphomas, and many of them are approved for these cancers. But they have very little activity in solid tumors. A CAR T cell consists of a T cell that also expresses a single chain FV that recognizes tumor antigen, for example, mesothelium and it has the CD3 zeta chain of the T cell receptor that mediates signaling along with a co-stimulator molecule. So what the scientists at TCR Therapeutics did, they designed a truck or a T cell receptor fusion construct, and it consists of an anti mesothelial antibody linked to the epsilon chain of the T cell receptor. So upon lentivirus transduction, it integrates with the entire T cell receptor. So the signaling is mediated by the entire T cell receptor rather than just the CD3 zeta chain as with a CAR T cell. And in the preclinical studies, they showed that the, it has anti-tumor efficacy in preclinical mesothelium positive tumor model. They showed functional persistence of TC210 cell and uh, they showed better efficacy than CAR T cells using the same antibody. So these are mesothelioma tumors uh, treated with saline, treated with the truck T cells. You can see complete response, which is sustained. Whereas with the same anti mesothelium CAR, you get regression when the tumors start to come back. Based on this study, they designed a phase one study of TC210. So this is for patients with 
mesothelioma, lung adenocarcinoma, ovarian cancer, and cholangiocarcinoma. And these are patients who have failed standard therapies for the cancer. And the patient's tumor is evaluated for mesothelial expression, and only patients who have high expressions are enrolled. P patients undergo leukophoresis, and then we use these T cells from the leukophoresis to make TC210, which is basically the T cells expressing the anti mesothelial single gen FV. And this takes about two to three months to make the drug. And uh, patients who are, and get treated, they get lymphodepletion with cyclophosphamide and fludarabine, followed by the TC210 uh, infusion. And this is the dose escalation cohorts. We started with dose level one. Uh, patient received five times 10 to the seven cells per meter square. Dose level two and three, where the patients get one time 10 to the eight cells per meter square. And currently we are treating patients at five times 10 to the eight cells per meter square. And uh, so I'm going to show you data for the first eight patients enrolled on the study. Uh, and as you can see, uh, most of them were male. Uh, Seven of the eight patients had malignant pleuromesothelioma. One patient had ovarian cancer, and they had high mesothelial expression. Very heavily pretreated patients, patients having received two to nine different lines of therapy, and all had received, most of them had received prior immunotherapy. So in terms of the grade three or greater treatment adverse event, the most common was hematologic side effects uh, because of the chemotherapy. In addition, patients had cytokine release syndrome. In two of the eight patients, it was grade three, which is caused because these T cells recognize the tumor cells and release a lot of cytokine, and that can result in fever, hypertension, shortness of breath. So out of the uh, eight, first eight patients, uh, three patients had partial response, and in two of the patients, it was a confirmed partial response whereas one patient uh, died from systemic infection, fungemia, uh, as a result of the conditioning regimen. And so in summary, uh, the phase one dose escalation of TC210 is ongoing. Cytokine release syndrome is common but manageable side effect. Uh, we have seen radiological and biomarker response in some patients. And we expect the phase one part of the study to be completed by end of uh, this year, and hopefully uh, if the studies continue to be positive to do a phase two study in patients with mesothelioma. So uh, lastly, uh, I would like to thank uh, members of my lab uh, for their uh, work, uh, especially developing the mesothelial targeted therapies, the clinical team for the clinical trials, as well as my NIH collaborators and scientists at TCR Therapeutics. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, it's a great lecture for us. Um, we have some questions for you from our yeah. colleagues. Um, uh, one of them is from Binur Önal. Uh, she's a pathology uh, professor. Uh, the first question is, Karolinska Group from Sweden reports satisfactory results concerning immunohistochemical chemical assessment of PDL1 expression in mesothelioma effusion, similar to those reported for histological specimen. How is your opinion? Oh, PD1 and PDL1, let me make sure I get it right. PDL1 in surgical specimen versus cytologic specimen. Is that the question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I'm not a pathologist, but my wife is a pathologist. So, <laughs> so, so uh, I assume normally for the, you know, I'm more used to looking at PDL1 in the tumor sample, but um, I would assume that cytology might be as good. Although, to be honest, I don't have, uh, I don't have experience with that. What is your experience? Do you think they are similar or? Uh, no, we don't have our domestic results uh, in Turkey yet. However, uh, Karolinska group from Sweden under CRP and his team reports quite satisfactory comparative results, cytology, histology. I see. Uh, that in cell, uh, not cell blocks, in cytosine materials. Yeah, yeah. 
I think that's possible uh, that it could be good. As you know that uh, for mesotheliomas, we always worry about the cytology specimen because you cannot make architecture. So for the initial diagnosis, we always use the, uh, uh, the surgical specimen, but for follow-up biopsies, I think cytology might be as good as well as the pleurofluorids. Thank you so much. And I have a quick second question. Uh, sure. Professor Ak, may I ask? Sure, yes. absolutely. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, can mesothelin ERC be regarded as a biomarker for malignancy as a suitable complement to hyaluronan when yeah. it's again a cytopathology approach question? Yeah. But when diagnosing, when we diagnose, already uh, make a, a diagnosis of malignant mesothelioma in an effusion, yeah. Uh, can we use uh, the mesothelin ERC as a complementary and would it be enough to make a diagnosis of mesothelioma? Yeah. And thank so, you very much for your great, inspiring lecture overall. Thank you very much. So for cytology, I don't think so because the problem there is that the normal mesothelial cells also express mesothelin. So it is possible that the cytology specimen might have reactive mesothelial cells that express mesothelin. So I think in cytology, it may be tricky and may not be sufficiently specific because you can get mesothelin on the reactive mesothelial cells. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we have a question from Professor Muzaffer. For checkmate study, immunotherapy for non epithelioid group result longer survival with statistical significance compared to epithelioid group. However, about 75% uh, uh, of the patients were in uh, the epithelioid group. So uh, is it possible that changing survival data influenced by num patient number in the groups? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, uh, clearly, the benefit is more than double, as uh, Muzaffar said, with the sarcomatoid histology. But still, the epithelioid histology was 76% of the patients, and there was some there was improvement with immunotherapy compared to chemotherapy in epithelioid by itself. But the magnitude of benefit is not as great. So you know, some centers continue to use chemotherapy as the first treatment, uh, but I think the FDA approved it regardless of histology. So there was some data presented at IMIC this year uh, by Sanjay Popat, who showed that the quality of life was better in the immunotherapy group compared to chemotherapy group. So that might make one think more about doing immunotherapy first. But again, there's a lot of cost. These are very expensive treatments and they do have other side effects, uh, autoimmune side effects, diarrhea, other uh, endocrine side effects. So it's not a very easy treatment. So for epithelioid histology, uh, you know, sometimes I use just chemotherapy to begin with in some patient immunotherapy. So but it is approved for both, but. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We have another question from uh, Professor Ülke Yılmaz. Do you see TTF low intensity intermediate frequency alternating electric field in mesothelioma treatment? Or oh, the electric field treatment? Yeah, yeah, so I don't know that, I'm not very enthusiastic about that and I really, uh, it was approved as a device and uh, the benefit was pretty marginal and it was a single arm study. So we do not use that. I, I don't think many centers in the US use those treatment targeted fields. Uh, uh, I have a question for you uh, yeah. about uh, LM, LM, LMB100. Uh, How do you inject uh, the LMB100 into the tumor of the patients. I mean, uh, mesothelioma is a diffuse um, disease and uh, start multifocally uh, and uh, at, this, at the same time uh, from different uh, size of the pleura. How do you inject it? Yeah, Where very do you question. inject it? Yeah, yeah, no, excellent question. So we just got the protocol approved 
And uh, so we hope to treat our first patient in the next month or so. So we're going to do it with our intervention radiologist. But as you correctly pointed out, uh, pleural mesothelioma is not a discrete lesion. It is basically covering most of the lung. So what we plan to do is inject uh, uh, three or four sites and to start the inflammation. But we hope that injecting LMB100 in, into the tumor plus CTLA for antibody results in systemic immunity so that can shrink tumors in the uninjected site. Because getting a little bit shrinkage where you inject is not going to help the patient. So if our hypothesis is that you just stimulate the immune system enough that it can kill tumors in uninjected site, that will be beneficial. So we plan to work with our intervention radiologists select the sites to inject, uh, four or five sites, and then monitor tumor shrinkage, both in the injected and the uninjected site. But, uh, you know, it is, these are big tumors, so we'll just have to see if it works or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We have another question from Halil Ibrahim Bulut. Could stimulation of CD103 uh, positive cell, such as uh, FLT3L injection, increase the effectiveness of current CAR approaches? Sorry, could you repeat that again? Uh, could stimulation of, C, uh, stimulation of CD103 positive cell, such as FLT3L injection increase the effectiveness of current CAR approaches. Yeah. CAR so, approaches. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I'm not very familiar with that. Not sure. Not sure. Okay. Yes, please, Hassan Abi. Uh, well, I'm sorry I joined late. It was uh, I, oh, you know, another webinar. You know, this was all. Webinars all along. I, I had a surgical webinar, so I, I missed most of the talk. But I just would like to ask a couple of questions about the most yeah. practical things. So we started some of the patients treating them with immunotherapy, uh, with mesothelium, especially those biphasic ones. And we had like a patient with PDL one ninety percent positive, and he and she got she had preoperatively very thin pleura, but a couple of positive posterior intercostal lymph nodes just along the side of the vertebra. So she got treatment and we operated and there was no tumor in the pleura, just a few cells left in the intercostal nodes, but live, live cells left. We have now other patients coming up with similar combinations and they're getting immunotherapy and we, some of them will get uh, treatment. And we had a sarcomatoid patient with a very extensive lesion, got immunotherapy, was under control. He recurred one year later in the brain, not local regionally. That was amazing. Yeah. Uh, one of the things is in our recent last five years or 10 years of practice, we see more and more biphasic. Is this because of more detailed evaluation of the tissue? And actually we were we already had biphasic all along for many, many years, but we were thinking they were either epithelial for a long time. Is that the same thing you observe or our percentage is more than 50% now biphasic? Yeah, that's uh, good to hear. Good to see you and thanks for your question. So uh, that's very interesting. So 50% appears to be a little high number, but I agree with you. The pathologists have, uh, you know, as there's a lot of mesothelioma and there's a lot of interest. And I think the pathologists do a good job in a more detailed report. So before it could be just epithelioid, as you said, sarcomatoid. But I think now they focus more on defining what percent is epithelioid, what percent is sarcomatoid. Uh, but yeah, we do see a lot of biphasic, but I wonder whether it is because of better path reports or description. So I'm not a pathologist, but I think they have some criteria that it needs to be above certain percent, I guess 20 or 25 to be called biphasic. Um, and also, as you know, more than anyone else, it also depends where you biopsy. So I'm sure that you have seen that you get patients who are 
called epithelioid or biphasic. And then when you go in, it might come out all as sarcomatoid. So there is this sampling error also that we get surprised. But yeah, no, I think the biphasic is because we get better reports and uh, better quantification. Um, but I think that is important uh, clinically now that with the immunotherapy, if it is sarcomatoid or predominantly biphasic, then they should definitely get immunotherapy as first therapy because it is a huge impact. But if it is sarcomatoid, we have the option doing chemotherapy uh, as the first treatment. 